Hello, my name is Ernesto Schwartz, and I'm a lecturer in sociology at Exeter University. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about the project we call Citizen-Led Forensics. Uh, I specialize in science and technology studies, and um, if I had to define my field, I work in the sociology of science and justice in Latin America. One of the things that I would like to start my presentation with is where, where my journey began. Uh, and my journey begins 15 years ago, 14 years ago, here in Exeter University. I came from Mexico City to study in a unique research center uh, called IGEN, it's a center for the study of life sciences where now I work as a lecturer. And 14 years ago, I went to study genomics. I was really interested in the relationships and exploring the different ways in which race and genomics um, intersect in Latin America. And I studied this research center called INMEGEN. And I'm not going to bore you with all the details because just this, this is just a preamble to my research. I learned about this law called the Genomic Sovereignty Law that gave each Mexican the unique property of their DNA. And in those days, I didn't make a lot about that law, except that it was, for me, almost impossible for any of us to really enjoy the fruits of our, our DNA because we are not scientists. Um, and I, I wrote a couple of critical papers about it. But then in 2008, uh, the so-called war against drugs was raging in my country. And in 2011, it was the worst year uh, regarding violence. Today, there are around 73,000 people disappeared, uh, around 37,000 corpses still to be identified, and around 300,000 people killed in the last 12 years. For you to have an idea, this is approximately the same amount of people that disappear in Colombia in 50 years of war. And the scale of violence and the dereliction of duty of the state is off the charts. So I was thinking, uh, along with my colleagues, um, how do we move from just thinking about the world, all right, to actually acting in the world? But we, we don't think, we actually don't agree with this classic idea of Marx that philosophers have only interpreted the world so far, but the point is to change it. We actually think that interpretations of the world matter. And some of these interpretations are quite radical. And what we wanted to do is rethink the role of families in the middle of crisis, of humanitarian atrocities, of war and conflict, and the way in which they have collected evidence of these crimes, and evidence that can help them reconstruct the identity of their kids. And what you see here is this project that was funded by the ESRC called Ciencia Forense Ciudadana in Spanish, or Citizen-Led Forensic in English. And this is the only project that built, and I built this together with Dr. Cruz Santiago, that built a unique DNA forensic database that was managed, created, and governed by the relatives of the disappeared. And the point we thought is why we have never thought about a DNA database that is actually produced by the very victims of violence. This is the perfect place to start. You cannot contaminate your DNA. Most of the human remains are so degraded that it, only with DNA you can identify them. And we can break one of the central conflicts of interest of the current humanitarian system, and that is that you're asking the state that might be working with organized crime and corrupt authorities to go and investigate itself. It's like asking someone that just broke into your house to please give himself or herself, probably say himself, sentence, okay, and then go and make sure that he fulfills that sentence and he stays in jail for five years. That wouldn't make sense. No, none of us would do that, right? But that's exactly how the international forensic system works. That's what we are asking states that might be working with organized crime to do. And when I think about this issue, I think that this is because interpretation, interpretations matter. They are not just things outside of the world. The way we think about humanitarian intervention matters. And if we start thinking that relatives and victims of human rights atrocities can govern their own forensic system, especially when they're in the middle of uh, atrocities like the Mexican one and in complex um, scenarios such as Colombia and other places in Latin America, then inter interpretation is always an intervention. But we wanted to go a little bit beyond that because we think that not all interventions are equal, right? Writing a paper showing how these colonial legacies of the state still oppress people in the global south, we thought it was not enough. People are actually suffering, looking for their kids in the ground. So we thought about the participatory aspects of the sociology of science. So those participatory aspects have to do with the innovation of this research, which is why people, when we talk about citizen science, they are not really governing the fruits of their labor. The key aspect of our research is that the mothers and fathers of the disappear can govern 
the product of their labor. They are the owners of that DNA database. They can do that as they wish, what they find most useful. And of course that goes against the whole political doctrines that have shaped forensic science so far. So we think that defiance, therefore, is a theoretical intervention. There are things in the world that you can only study when you are challenging them. There are frontiers that don't appear in social science until you confront them. So we thought that we would work with these 16 groups of mothers and fathers of these appeared to create this unique forensic system. And we would start with the exhumation of Brenda Damaris in Nuevo León, in Monterrey, one of the uh, parts of the country that has suffered more uh, violence coming from both organized crime and government officials, sometimes working together, sometimes working against each other. And therefore, we were with the grassroots organization Fundel and Letty Roy. Letty Roy is a mother that, through her own independent investigations, found three people that were kidnapped. And she has learned how to use GPS and other technologies, forensic technologies, in, throughout these 11 years of searching for her son. And with her, we identified the remains of Brenda Damaris Solis with an independent forensic team and what, with independent for, uh, efforts. And thanks, of course, to the funding of the ESRC. Just so you have an idea, $8,000, that is six years ago, was the cost of identifying these bone fragments. And that's more than the salary that the whole family of factory workers would get in Mexico. So even though the state allows you to do your own independent forensic uh, research, if you don't have the money, it's basically impossible. And that, that leads me to my, my third point. What is the state in Mexico? It's not just the baddies, it's not the bad guys. The state is a man in a rundown office fearing for his life because he's been threatened by organized crime. The state is also the chief of the drug cartel in a specific place. In fact, many families told us that the jefe de plaza, that is the leader of the drug cartel, might be the same guy that they met before in the government. And today, for instance, uh, one of the top security uh, ministers in Mexico is being charged with organized crime in New York, Genaro Garcia Luna. So this goes all the way from presidential politics to local politics. But at the same time, the state is the one protecting the families. So other parts of this huge uh, machine we call the state are protecting families of the disappeared that are activists searching for their kids and that are collecting this forensic evidence and therefore are threatened by organized crime and corrupt government officials. So I don't want just to paint a picture of one bad state, but it's a, it's a multiple state that has different faces. And of course, um, this project gathered lots of attention. Um, in 2017, the BBC drama Silent Witness did a season finale based on the project. It's called Proyecto Reunido, which is Project Reunited. And it's based on this DNA database that the mothers collected themselves. They decided to present this sicario. Of course, no one in Mexico is going to kill you like that. They are not running uh, in the streets full of tattoos, okay? You would not identify a sicario like that. Sometimes they are your waiters, sometimes they are uh, government, government officials. But we thought that one of the key aspects was to bring new interventions, new representations to the fore. So in this new project we have developed, we created soap operas, for instance, to talk about kidnapping and disappearance. We created um, some small documentaries. So we can tell more complex stories that are not just about the baddies that you see here. But we always want uh, to make sure that we communicate one key thing. Would you ask your oppressors for charity, which is basically what is happening in Mexico? We are asking the people that are oppressing either through bureaucratic means, not giving you the tools or the support to identify your loved one, or directly as being part of organized and violent um, cartels to help you. And that's one of the, of the key aspects of the critiques of our project. Our project is really against this notion of neutrality and objectivity. You cannot be neutral and objective when actually bits and pieces of the state are involved in crimes against humanity or actually are disappearing people and evidence. So we thought there was something missing in the way in which international organizations that direct their resources and aid and expertise because they train to, so, well, they tend to train solely state experts, government experts. And this is an extract of the one-year uh, ethnography we did in Mexico City. 
Uh, we call these participatory ethnographies because mostly we study, we live with the people, we travel with them to the mass graves, to the places in which they recover bone fragments, but also to high level government meetings. And one of the things we wanted to do is become a little, a small bridge, if you like, between government officials, international organizations and families. And therefore we asked for a lot of dialogue to happen and training. And one of the, the things we wanted to do is to make sure that at least international organizations that have more resources than our project could start um, training and giving their aid directly to the mothers and fathers of the disappear. And this is for a very simple reason. Most of the fathers and mothers of the disappeared and sisters and daughters have been searching for their kids for decades. And the government officials and the international organizations are going to be there for three, four, five years tops. So this uh, small ex extract of that conversation we had in 2014, uh, in which basically the inter International Red Cross were telling the families that they could not train them because they were not government officials. Before they say because they didn't have the credentials, and many of the relatives said, well, actually I have a BA in communication legal studies, because one of the things that happen when you are searching for their ki your kid for so long is that you start gaining the expertise, and many of them now have masters when they didn't finish secondary school in their normal lives. So one of the things that is uh, really interesting is how they become what we call lay experts. Uh, of course, we were accused of being more neoliberal than the neoliberals. That is because we were thinking that people could build their own scientific tools and scientific evidence with their own hands, and they could govern it themselves. So. The question we ask is, and we were asked a lot, is the responsibility of families of disappear to collect and produce the evidence themselves? And we think that's not the case. But there's no other thing happening in Mexico. That's what's already happening to them. They already have to carry the burden of proof and make sure they produce enough evidence to identify their kids. Uh, but of course, no one asked the other question, why they are free to suffer disappearance and victimization throughout decades without having any tools or means to have independent knowledge. And basically, that leads us to one key aspect of our research, that is, from the perspective of intervention and action, there are never the right historical conditions. In fact, you could think that Mexico is exactly the place where the not right historical condition exists. There is widespread corruption, those people that have been fighting this corruption and this reelection of duty have been taken out of government or have been killed. And mothers are fighting for justice against all odds. Even with the new change of government, there's not enough money to treat or to identify all the corpses and mass graves that are found all across the country. So therefore, there are never the, the right historical conditions. And this is something a sociologist uh, might think about agency produces the conditions of possibility. So our own action is what brings about these historical conditions, the right historical conditions. And here are just some pictures of that year we spent with the mothers of disappeared, some of which are looking for their kids that are police officers that were neglected and left in war zones and never um, identified. Uh, and also many hundreds of families that are searching for the kids because they were in the wrong place in the wrong time. They disappear maybe on transit, uh, maybe buying something in the store. They were in the middle of a, a confrontation between drug cartels. Uh, and basically this, this brings us to the conclusion. The ontology sucks. And when I think uh, about the ontology, this is the big academic work to talk about what should be done. The idea that we have some predefined notion of what the world should look like and what are ethical standards sometimes blinds us to what's going on in the ground. So this brings, brings us back to the first point we say about an intervention is also an interpretation. By radically reinterpreting, looking at the way in which families have collected evidence for decades, my colleague and I, Dr. Ali Cruz, uh, devised a forensic system that is not dependent on the charity of governments. The whole point is not just to follow pre-given ethical standards, but to use sociology and social sciences to question these power mechanisms, and if possible, bring some new uh, possibilities to the world, such as citizen-led forensics. And I would like to thank you for your time, 
and that's it.